Hey guys, welcome back. My name is Dave and this is the OK Teacher. In our last video we talked about the start of World War I. We discussed basically some of the main ideas of the, of the conflict, including who are the most important countries involved, when did the war start, where was the war fought, and why the war began, largely a product of the tension that existed in Europe at the start of the 20th century. If you missed that video, you can click the link above and you can find it there. And if you're interested in following along as I produce more of these videos, you can hit the subscribe button below and make sure you catch me in the next video as well. For today, what I'd like to talk about is the technology of World War I. The big pieces that I'd like to discuss is what technology were, was important at the time. And, and most importantly, I'd like to get into a little analysis of, of why it was significant and what made this technology uh, significant during the war. Like the last time, I've started by going back and taking a look at a primary source. Now, a primary source is a, a document or, or an object from the time and the place of the historical event that we're studying. And in this case, I've used Google News Archives to go back and take a look at the Ottawa Citizen from October the 2nd, 1914. So this is my local paper, and I just scrolled through looking for information about technology in the war, and I found this. This is an article talking about the, it's, it's titled The Magnificent Fire of the Artillery. And uh, essentially this article just talks about how, how impactful artillery was during the First World War. There's a story in there about uh, French, uh, French artillery battalion, which essentially made a graveyard of a German battalion. And the, the passage that I'm, I'm really caught my eye was here at the bottom. It says, it's no wonder that the Germans have nicknamed the big French guns in the field artillery, the Black Butchers. Their effect is terrible. So this is something that I'm going to want to investigate a little bit more. Based on a primary source, it seems like this is a fairly significant piece of technology uh, during, during the war. Another piece that we can use to investigate historical issues is taking a look at secondary sources. Now a secondary source is something like a textbook or a book that's published later, where an author has collected a number of primary sources and collected information from other secondary sources as well and is presenting them in a condensed form. So a history textbook would be an example of a secondary source that pulls information from a variety of places. This particular one is a book written by Alan Axelrod uh, called The Battle of the Somme. And I'm just going to read one passage here uh, about some of, the, some of the technology that was used at the war. There were stories, says Alan Axelrod, many stories of men who could not find a way through or around the German wire that the artillery barrage had failed to destroy, though its destruction had been promised and therefore assumed. Survivors spoke of seeing men cut down like wheat in a field, cut down in their serried ranks, Upright one second, prostrate the next, a harvested crop. But even more terrifying were the word pictures painted of men bumbling into barbed wire, hung up upon it in grotesque postures, shredded by machine gun bursts, and left in their shreds of gore and rags like an army of scarecrows that had been stripped down and torn by some cyclonic wind. So, pretty clearly a... a description of a, of a violent battlefield, but there were a couple of references in there to technology which, which caught my eye. And so, on, on summary, uh, these are based on just these two sources. I've identified a couple of primary, uh, a couple of uh, pieces of technology that I think are worth investigating. I would like to learn a little bit more then about machine guns, uh, barbed wire, artillery, and shrapnel during the First World War. And that's really going to be my focus today is talking about those pieces of technology. So I'm going to use some additional primary sources here as well. If you click the link in the slides, and by the way, my slides that I use in this are all available on my website at okteach.ca. So you can check those out and you can access these slides and make a copy and use them however you like. In there, I've linked to a section from the Canadian War Museum website called Objects and Photos. And this basically is a, a collection of, of artifacts that are held at the Canadian War Museum and a brief description of some of them uh, that, that sort of tells you about what they are and how they were used. So I've used a, a number of, of these throughout my, my slides here to tell you about the technology uh, of the First World War. And I'm going to start by talking about the machine guns. Machine guns are a development in, in rifle technology that really kind of came into their own at the start of World War I. They had a very high rate of fire, 
approximately 500 rounds a minute. And essentially what made a machine gun so effective is the fact that it used the recoil from the fire to eject and then reload the next bullet, allowing machine guns to shoot very, very quickly. They weren't as sophisticated then as, as they are today. We think of machine guns today and we sort of think of, you know, Rambo charging through the forest, firing a machine gun off each arm. They really weren't that miniaturized and, and efficient uh, back then. They were very, very heavy. Uh, they, they weighed about 50 pounds. They required a tripod to, to hold them and to aim. And they had to be water-cooled to help prevent the barrel from warping from the heat of all the rounds escaping. So a machine gun would be a very heavy piece of equipment and, carry, and required a lot of ammunition as well. In fact, the Vickers machine gun, which I've showed here, uh, required a team of five men to operate to be reloading and, and firing and, and managing the water. So uh, very effective, very deadly, but also very heavy and, and not very mobile. Machine guns were one of those really important pieces of technology and it was mentioned in the source. You can see at battles, particularly like the Battle of the Somme, uh, where, where machine guns played such a huge role as, as waves and waves of men were cut down by the high rate of fire of these machine guns. And they were used by both sides. Barbed wire was mentioned in the sources as well. Now barbed wire uh, is not a wartime invention. It was, it's used by ranchers and, and farmers everywhere to help keep cattle on the farm. But during the First World War, it, it was applied in, in a military sense as well. Essentially, the opposing armies would lay huge fields of barbed wire in front of their positions in an effort to slow down any enemy advances. Barbed wire would be, the, the artillery would, would try to blow up the barbed wire, but the fuses on the artillery wasn't very sensitive at the time. So very often what happened is the artillery would go right through the wire, blow up underneath it, fire it up into the air, at which point it would land in an even more tangled heap than it was when it began. So we end up with these uh, fields of twisted and tangled barbed wire. Now, many of us have probably, as kids or, or uh, you know, running through the countryside, tried to hop a barbed wire fence. Um, it's really not that difficult, but we're not really talking about a single uh, strand of barbed wire. We're talking about a, a very significant sort of uh, pile of it. This is an example of a, a, a three gravestones underneath barbed wire. We can see just how thick and tangled that is. And barbed wire would be, therefore, it would restrict movement and, and slow enemy advances. So any attack that you made, any movement that you made, might have to move through these big fields of barbed wire, and that would really slow you down as it caught on your clothes and, ca and caught on your uh, gear and whatnot. So barbed wire is another piece that kind of pairs well with machine guns. And when I say pairs well, I mean it killed a lot of people. Uh, the machine guns uh, laying down very, very heavy fire and the barbed wire slowing down to make sure that they were easier to hit. The big butchers that were discussed in that Ottawa Citizen article refers to the artillery. And artillery essentially means the, the heavy, large guns on a battlefield. In this case, I've highlighted a, a World War I howitzer from Germany. Uh, and I, I, I want to talk a little bit about what, what it looks like. It fired shells that were 21 centimeters in diameter. So uh, a German shell might, from this gun might be about that big, uh, that big around. Uh, and they could fire up to 8,200 uh, meters away. In practice, what that means is that you're almost constantly exposed to artillery fire. It can come from almost anywhere and there's very little you can do to stop the enemy from shelling you. Uh, once you're within this eight kilometer range, you're vulnerable to artillery shelling at almost any time. And artillery fires two main types of shells in World War I. Uh, one of them would be an explosive round, which is pretty typically what we might expect from, a, from an artillery piece. Uh, a large shell that when it hits the ground blows up from a contact fuse. So as soon as the nose of the shell hits something, it explodes. The other piece is something that was used extensively in World War I and, and really sort of adds an extra dimension to the impact of these weapons uh, would be the, the use of what's called shrapnel. Now shrapnel is a particular type of explosive where instead of exploding when it hits the ground, it explodes in the, mid of, in the middle of its flight. It explodes in midair. Uh, 
So we can see here, for example, uh, this is an example of what a shrapnel shell would look like. Now, I found this particular picture on Reddit and I've linked it to the post here, but this is from the Canadian War Museum as well. What you can see looking at this shell is, is two things that are worth paying attention to. Number one, on the front of the shell here, we see a collection of, of small metal balls. And the, the entire front of the shell would be packed with these things uh, um, and ready to explode at a later, at a later uh, when it, once it was fired. This section right here is an explosive charge designed to explode in the middle of air. And when it did, it would scatter these metal, metal balls across the field. And these wicks at the back, those are a, a timer fuse, essentially. And so those would, be, those would determine how long from the moment it was fired until the moment its shells uh, released. And, and these were used extensively in the war. And, and when they did, uh, they, they posed an extreme danger to soldiers in the field. You can see in this picture, for example, also from the Canadian War Museum, this explosion in midair is a shrapnel shell exploding and when it did it would fire uh, it would it would blast these metal balls uh, across a large radius nearby and there's very little you could do to stop it when I was thinking about these shells I was thinking about uh, the best example I've seen of, of that was when I was on a trip with a class and we went to Yeep in Belgium and when I was there uh, we went to this shop uh, in the main on the main sort of avenue in in, in Yeep, and it was called the British Grenadier. And uh, I went online and I searched, and and using Google Street View, uh, there's a look inside here. And and there's a, a, a if, if anybody I don't know if you're ever going to find yourself in Yeep, but if you do, this is a shop that's really worth checking out. He's collected a, a, a huge collection of, of World War One memorabilia, and they're from a from a variety of different places. In this sort of display case in the back, we see helmets and bayonets and rifles. And uh, I remember him showing us little flechettes, which are little arrows which would be dropped from airplanes during the First World War. And we see an example down here of a large artillery shell. Uh, this would be approximately, it looks to me, about 21 centimeters uh, in, in size. So this is the size of the artillery shell that we would be talking about in the First World War. Now what made me think about this is that I remember the last time I was there uh, seeing up here in the upper right hand corner or the upper left hand corner uh, uh, an, a, a cutout of an artillery shell and uh, showed just how they packed all those balls in and, and, and how, how many of them would be packed inside this shell. And I remember seeing that as well and remember seeing down here these buckets. Now these buckets are actually filled with little balls which are left over from World War I. Uh, I wish I could zoom in and show you, but I suppose that's the limits of technology that we're dealing with today. Uh, I can only take you on so, on so much of a virtual tour of a shop in, in Yeep. But in any case, uh, it's kind of a cool story. In Belgium, they have every year, uh, well, they refer to it as what's called the Iron Harvest. Uh, there were hundreds of millions of shells fired over the course of World War I, and most of them ended up uh, planted in fields in Belgium. Uh, and as, even today, uh, 100 years after the end of the war, as farmers plow their fields and, and turn up the soil, they're still constantly finding old pieces of equipment from World War I, whether it's barbed wire, uh, unexploded shells, uh, shrapnel, um, rifles, bullets, they, they are still finding uh, much of it today. And the procedure is essentially, uh, and, and it was the tour from the, the British Grenadier that, that told me this, that when you find equipment, you are taught to identify it, and you take the equipment and you go put it next to a telephone pole. And then there's a phone number you call that tells the people uh, tell the government, hey, I've, I've, I've found some artillery. I've laid it next to uh, laid it next to this telephone pole, and then you give it a code, uh, whether it's a, a code one, which is they'll be there within uh, a week. Code two is they'll be there within a day, or code three is they'll be there within an hour, depending on the danger of the equipment you found. But in any case, 
two big takeaways from here. Uh, number one, the the amount of shrapnel that was used uh, was such that it's still being turned dug up a hundred years later uh, in Belgium. And number two, if you ever get the chance to go to Yeep and uh, see the city of Yeep in Belgium, uh, th this is a really cool shop that's worth checking out. So that's shrapnel, and that's how and and that's how it kind of works. And, and that plus the uh, explosive shells would be the two big impacts of artillery during the First World War. So, like last time, we sort of arrive at this point where we talk about, well, well what have we learned? Uh, what, what, is the, what is the big uh, conclusion that we can draw? And, and, and again, we can identify, and I could read an article that says, here are the important technologies that are used in World War One, but the big piece that we really want to do is is add a layer of analysis and add a layer of context so we can understand not just what was important but we really do need to understand why it's important as well and this is where we begin assigning significance to technology and and talk about the the technological impact some historians will place an extraordinary amount of value on technology as a, as a tool to understand civilizations. Uh, the, the classic example of that would be looking at something like the stirrup, uh, which is used to ride horses. And because of the stirrup, it allows you to swing a sword effectively from horseback. And because of that, it allows the creation of knights. And because knights require uh, training and, and uh, um, require a, a vast amount of resources to get to be able to do it effectively. Uh, it recreates a whole social system around that. That's a pretty classic technological uh, determinist argument in, in historical study. In World War I, we really want to look at what were these technologies and, and, and how do they impact the war? Uh, how did they change things? And, and that is really what allows us to discuss the significance uh, of these things in World War I. So uh, I want to ask the question, how? How did they affect the war and how did they influence the fighting? And by doing that, we'll get to uh, identify some of the significance of these weapons. So based on what we've learned about these technologies, even just from a cursory look at them, uh, um, these the impact on the war uh, starts to starts to create a pattern. For one thing, we can take a look at machine guns, which were very, very deadly, uh, but immobile. These would not be weapons that would be very useful if you were mounting an attack, uh, because it required five people to operate, because it was so heavy. These guns were really more effective if they were placed on your battle lines and used to, to repel attacks uh, against you. They would not be super effective carried along and, and, and brought on to an attack. So uh, one piece that we have to understand about machine guns is that they really were a tool that benefited the defender more than the attacker. We add on to that the idea of barbed wire, which is designed to help the defender as well by slowing down any attackers and making it easier for them to, to be shot or making it more likely that they would be out in the open for longer and exposing them to other methods, uh, uh, other weapons of, of war. So between machine guns and barbed wire, there's two pretty significant advantages given to the, to the defender. The final piece would be looking at artillery and shrapnel. Because artillery and shrapnel could come from anywhere at any time, and because it covered such a vast range uh, by exploding in midair in some cases, or, or being really these, these large explosives when they hit the ground, artillery and shrapnel made it extremely dangerous to be out in the open at any time. This would be a disadvantage to both the attacker and the defender, but, it, but it, particularly for the attacker. During the war, we end up with systems where you're trying to stay out of the way of artillery. Uh, it means digging trenches and, and taking cover. And these are not things that you can do when you're attacking. So the overall conclusion that I would reach by looking at all of those is that the technology of World War I, particularly the important technology, played a, played a very significant uh, role in giving an advantage to the defender. Attackers were severely disadvantaged. They were simply able to use rifles while the defender was protected by barbed wire and, and uh, machine guns and, and the artillery and shrapnel constantly exploding across the battlefield.
this technology work together to make World War I a defensive struggle. And when we talk about why did the war last as long as it did and why were the casualties so bad, understanding the technology of the war really kind of brings that into light. World War I became a defensive struggle because of the weapons uh, that were used during that conflict. So that's the big conclusion that I would like to sort of arrive at when we talk about the technology of the war. In our next lesson, we're going to start to take a look at uh, what the battlefield looked like because of this. We'll take a look at the trenches in World War I and talk about the experience of soldiers a little bit. And we're also going to take a look in the next video as well uh, about by start investigating particular soldiers and talk about the value of researching individual soldiers to help learn about the conflict as a whole. So I hope you'll tune in in the future uh, in future videos for that. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give me the thumbs up and that helps me out a lot. Please make sure you subscribe so we don't miss any any future videos and I hope to see you in the next video. Thanks guys.